up in the next few months to do with the whole structure of our society. And we need as Christians to be standing firmly on the word of God and making sure our voice is heard. And it's such a thrill to be a part of a church which is actively engaged in that. So I'm, uh, I'm really blessed to be here tonight. So what I want to talk about tonight is, uh, is this subject, going where the evidence leads. You know, very often Christians encounter a criticism and we're told, you Christians believe things in spite of the evidence. And normally it's somebody who might be uh, sceptical of the Christian faith, they might be an outright, open, declared atheist, and they say things like, I go where the evidence leads. And what they mean by that is, science tells me what the truth is, and I believe what the scientists say. But you Christians, eh, you believe the writings of a bunch of old Jews in this book that you call the Bible. I mean, what would they know, really, about origins? Look at all the science and the technology that we have today. We people are really smart. These old Jews, they didn't know anything, really. And so we get a lot of ridicule and criticism. But I want to say to you tonight that I think, and I hope you'll agree with me as the evening wears on if you don't already, that all the evidence actually points towards the truth of the Word of God. Now, I should declare my hand here tonight and say to you that I actually believe that this book, the Bible, is God's word. Is anyone with me on that tonight? Yes. Yeah, yeah, we've got one or two there, Phil. That, that's good. You've got a good start. <laughs> Look, that's great, isn't it? Now, to say that I believe the Bible is God's word is actually a faith statement. You see, I can't prove that to you in some sort of mathematical way. But it's a very defensible faith statement because the evidence we see in the world around us clearly confirms the truth of the scriptures. So it really doesn't take much faith to believe that the Bible is true and that's what I want to talk about tonight. Now, I work for an organisation called Creation Ministries International and our heart is to encourage Christians to have confidence in the Bible right from the very beginning. And some people say, well, why does such a ministry even exist? And uh, I'd like to explain a little of my own life's journey to perhaps illuminate that question. You see, when I became a Christian, I was just 11 years old. Now, is anyone here, you young people, any 11-year-olds here tonight? Yep, I was always, always one, <laughs> young at heart. Some 11 year old. yep, yep, that's great. Well, I was just 11. And it was at a Billy Graham crusade in 1959. So now you know how old I am. <laughs> well, I grew up, um, I'm eternally grateful for the fact I grew up in a Christian household. But I grew up in a denomination which really didn't have what you would call a high view of scripture. Particularly with regards to the opening chapters of Genesis. So I just assumed that God must have used evolution to create seemed to make sense. I could study science, which I was interested in, and I could um, attend church, be a Christian. But you know what? I was a very confused Christian. I was full of doubts. I, I couldn't understand my own faith. I'd ask the leadership in my church, why did Jesus go to the cross for me? It's a pretty basic question, isn't it, for a Christian to ask? I mean, why couldn't he have come, lived on the earth, lived a good life, shown us how to relate to the Father, and then been transfigured up into heaven. Why the cross? The agony of the cross, why? And you know, the leadership in my church could not answer my question because they too believed that God used evolution to create. You see, if evolution's true and the Bible is wrong at the beginning, it affects the whole of the gospel message, as I will explain. So... I didn't know what to make of it until after my postgraduate work at university. And the Lord confronted me over this whole issue of origins and it started me on a, a journey of, uh, of reading and discovery. And I found to my great delight that not only could I believe that the opening chapters of Genesis were true because all the evidence points to that, but that I should believe it because those opening chapters form the very foundation stone of the whole of the gospel message. So that's why I do what I do today. But you know what? There's another message that we hear repeated over and over again. And it's, it's presented with all the authority of the establishment. 
And that's a story that tries to explain the existence of the entire universe in purely natural terms. Now, it sounds reasonable, because that's sort of scientific, that's the study of nature. But if you think about it, if you restrict yourself to purely natural explanations of the physical world and how it came to be, then what you are actually doing is excluding the possibility that there might be a supernatural explanation. So what that means is, you're really saying, without spelling it out clearly necessarily, there is no God. You see, if there's no God, then we have no choice but to use naturalistic explanations for our origins. But if there is a God, then there's another explanation, isn't there? Maybe God created the heavens and the earth. So the evolutionary story is inherently atheistic. So no wonder I was confused as a young man. I was trying to mix what is effectively an atheistic worldview with my developing Christian and biblical worldview. I was confused. I was a Christian, but I was confused. So, where do we go and what do we do with this whole issue? You know, a lot of people say, why does this stuff matter? And I want to share with you the results of a survey that was done in New South Wales a few years ago now and uh, scripture class students were asked what are the, the key questions that you have and th three of the four top questions were these. How can I know that God exists? Number one, isn't that interesting? Young people asking, how can I know God exists? Now if you think about it, if we keep telling our young people that the universe made itself over billions and billions of years of unguided random processes, then how can you know God exists? I mean, we all got here by accident, didn't we? That's what we're telling our young people. And then this one, how can I believe in a good God when there is so much suffering? Who's ever been asked that question? Anyone? Yeah? It's the classic question, isn't it? So many people use this as an excuse for rejecting God. What kind of God is it that creates a world full of suffering and death, they say? That's a pretty good question. That's one of the questions that I could not answer as a young man. And how about this one? Doesn't evolution prove that God doesn't exist? Three of the top four questions are directly what our ministry is all about. You see, folks, we need to be training our young people with answers so that they know how to defend their faith. There was a survey done recently in the US and it showed that up to 70% of Christian children brought up in a Christian home and in the church will walk away from the faith after they leave home. 70%. What a tragedy. Now, I'm sure you'd get different numbers if you surveyed different denominations, but the point is no percentage is acceptable, is it? So in our culture today, we are faced with an onslaught about the credibility of the Bible. And where does the attack come most? It comes at the very foundational issue of origins. How did we get here? That's the basic question. Now, some years ago, my wife and I were at uh, Mount Buffalo, and uh, we were enjoying the scenery there, and we happened to notice some young people who were abseiling and uh, took a photograph of, of uh, one of them, and we found that these people were from national parks and they were training in rescue techniques. And as we watched them, it occurred to me that as Christians, we are also called to be trained in rescue techniques. You see, if someone was trapped partway down that cliff and I was the only person at the top, I would be no use to them because I'm not trained to do that sort of thing. But the Bible says that we are to always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but to do it with gentleness and respect. And friends, that's what I could not do as a young man. Now, I don't mean the gentleness and respect bit. I mean, I didn't have answers. I didn't understand my faith, let alone be able to share my faith and answer the questions of other people. So that's what it's all about. It's being prepared and uh, being equipped to deal with the challenges that we have. You know, the Bible says that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength. The mind's got to be in there too. Not enough just to love the Lord with our hearts. We've got to have our minds in step. 
So it's important that we understand our faith. Now, friends, when you came in tonight, you would have received one of these uh, free magazines, uh, one per household or family. And uh, a number of our supporters are very passionate about making sure that as many people as possible get a hold of Creation magazine. I'm going to tell you a little more about that later on, and hopefully you got one of these. If you didn't, we'll give you an opportunity a bit later to... Uh, uh, to make sure that you do get one. But this is what I might call our number one witnessing weapon, and I'll explain why a bit later. We also have lots of books and DVDs in the foyer that you would have seen, because this subject of origins touches on so many different aspects. We have some things which are free, like uh, our website, and this is what the front page looks like. There's a new feature article there every day of the week, and we encourage people to go and have a look and, and uh, be strengthened in your faith. Now, if you have any questions at all, there's a search window up in the top right-hand corner there. So you just type in keywords and you get access to over 11,000 different articles fully referenced and peer-reviewed that are all there to equip you with answers. Now, it turns out we did have a bit of a problem with the web address and you can't get everything right. So we have a rather complicated web address, but... I found out that if you say something at the same time as seeing it, it helps to imprint it into your memory. So I want you to say the web address when it comes up on the screen. Are you ready? You ready? Yep. Okay. So if you want to know anything about creation, you just go to... Creation. Fantastic. That's pretty tough, isn't it? Reckon you can manage? <laughs> We also have a free email newsletter service that we send out if there's something we believe our subscribers would benefit from hearing about. Normally they link people to articles on the website. This particular one, the lead feature article, was the need for youth groups to be trained in creation apologetics. Because you know it's our young people who are being bombarded by this evolutionary story more than any other group in our society today. If you can convince young people that the universe made itself and then there's no God, then hey, look what you can do. Same-sex marriage. Everything goes. Man decides the rules, not God. So on your seats when you came in, you would have found one of these little leaflets. Now on the back is a form that you can fill out if you'd like to subscribe to our email newsletter service. We don't spam your inbox. And if you put your postcode there then if something's happening in your area, we can let you know about it. Now, a little bit later on, we're going to ask our volunteers to come in and collect those, so at your leisure, just uh, fill those things out. So I want to ask a question tonight. Is your faith supported by evidence? You see, the Bible does not demand of us a blind faith. Jesus doesn't say, switch off your brains and just believe. It's not like that. But we all believe something about our origins. Now we have to believe it by faith because we can't go back to the beginning to check it out, can we? So we believe things. We either believe there is a God who created this universe. We might believe there is no God at all. We might decide we haven't got a clue. But we believe something and we do so by faith. Now I want to use two images. The first one is of this little girl taking a tentative step into this pond or lake. Now she can see the ground underneath the water, so she knows that it's there. She's not going to drop into some huge abyss, but nonetheless, it still takes some faith, doesn't it, to take that step into the water. But all the evidence supports her faith. And I want to use this image to represent blind faith or a leap of faith in the absence of or even contrary to the evidence. Now, just hope that this young guy has checked that there are no rocks in the water or it's deep enough and all that sort of thing. So, let's just have a, a little look. Now, first of all, I should let you know that I had the great privilege of being able to work in the aerospace industry. And uh, I was involved in the design of all of Australia's national satellites. Have you seen those little grey dishes on rooftops? You know the things I mean? They're receiving things like Foxtel, Ostar, ABC, SBS, the commercial TV networks and so on. Now, you should understand that I have no accountability whatsoever for what comes over the satellites, all right? I hope you understand that. But I did have a lot to do with the design of the spacecraft themselves. So the kind of science that I've been involved in is what you could call 
operational science. Now, operational science is based on observable, repeatable experiments. And that's the kind of science which gives us all these amazing gadgets that we just take for granted, like communication satellites, mobile phones, computers, and all the amazing stuff we have. But the important thing about operational science is it's based on observations. And observations are only ever made in the present. Isn't that interesting? Only in the present. But there's another kind of science we hear a lot about. We could call it historical science. Now, this is still science, but it has a difference, a very important difference. This scientist is looking at a fossil in a rock, and he tries to work out what happened in the past to lead to what he's observing in the present. So he makes up a story about the past to explain the present. Now, something interesting happens when a scientist makes up a story about the past. And if you think about it, it's inevitable. He engages his beliefs about the past. So imagine this guy believes that evolutionary story with its millions and millions of years of unguided random processes. He looks at that little fossil and he might think to himself, I wonder where this little creature fits in that long, slow progression from that first primordial cell all the way up to complex organisms like you and me. I can imagine him wondering, how many millions of years ago did this little creature live? So can you see that what he believes already about this specimen determines how he interprets the evidence? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Now, let's imagine that this guy was a Bible-believing Christian. He looks at that little fossil in the rock. He may well think to himself, you know, this little fossil was likely laid down as a result of Noah's flood, which would have deposited pretty much the whole of the fossil record all around the world today. Now, friends, that's a radically different interpretation of exactly the same evidence. You see, we don't actually argue over the evidence because we've all got the same fossils, rocks, trees, stars, living systems, but our interpretation of the evidence depends upon what we already believe about our origins. So can you see that this is actually not a conflict between science and faith? It's a conflict between two different faiths. One faith that starts with the assumption there's no God and therefore we can only use naturalistic explanations. The other faith that says there is a God and in the case of Christianity, the God who's revealed himself in the Bible. So this is a conflict between two different faiths. So it's a little bit like this in a court of law. You know, the, um, the prosecution looks at the evidence and he interprets the evidence to mean that the accused is guilty. But then the defence lawyer stands up. He looks at exactly the same evidence and he interprets it as meaning that the accused is innocent. Completely different interpretations of the same evidence. Let me give you an example of how this works. We hear much about the age of things, the age of fossils and the age of rocks. So let's think about this a minute because scientists cannot measure age. Did you know that? What scientists measure are the physical and chemical properties of their samples. But you can't actually measure the age of things. You calculate the ages. So come with me on a bit of a thought experiment. Let's say you've just walked around the corner of your house into your backyard. And there, underneath a dripping tap, is a bucket partly filled with water. Now, because you're a scientific type, you can't help yourself. You measure the volume of water in the bucket and the rate at which the tap is dripping, as you do. And you ask yourself this all-important question, how long has the bucket been under the tap? So, let's say we measure six litres of water in the bucket and the tap's dripping at half a litre every hour. Who wants to have a go? How long has that bucket been under the tap? Anyone? Yep. 12 hours. 12 hours. Who thinks 12 hours? 12, yep. Few, few of you. Right. Sold to the man in the front. <laughs> 12 hours. Well, sounds reasonable. But remember, you just chanced upon the scene. You're doing your science in the present, like all science is done. You did not see the bucket put under the tap, right? So to get 12 hours, what did we assume? The bucket was empty when it went under the tap. How do you know? You weren't there, you didn't see it. What if it was already half filled? You'd be completely wrong, wouldn't you? What else did we assume? 
that the tap was dripping at the same rate. How do you know that? What if somebody had turned the tap on hard, partly filled the bucket, turned it off carelessly, left it dripping just seconds before you came round the corner? How would you know? You see, when you're not there to see it, you have no idea. What else did we assume? Sorry? A bird drinking out of it? Yeah, the dog could have had a drink out of the bucket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Might have rained, evaporation. I mean, the list goes on and on, doesn't it? All sorts of things can happen before you even turn up. But let's imagine that your backyard is a very important backyard and you have a resident historian who writes down everything that happens in your backyard. Now, I'm not sure if your backyard's quite in that class. Ours is not. <laughs> but the historian comes to you and says that at five past one this afternoon, I put the bucket under the tap and at 1.50, you came around the corner. So now you ask the question, how long has the bucket been under the tap? Who wants to have a go at that? How long? Anyone? 45 minutes. Who thinks 45 minutes? Anyone agreed? But I might say to you, ah, yes, but you're just a historian. I'm a scientist. And we have amazing technology. So good, in fact, you can measure the volume of water in buckets by counting the very molecules. Not only that, you can measure the drip rate of taps to the nearest millilitre per century. And when we apply this amazing and brilliant technology to the problem, actually, you're right. It's not 12 hours at all. It's 11.793621, down to the nearest microsecond. Impressive stuff. But with all that technology, am I any closer to the right answer? Who thinks I am? Who thinks the historian gets it right? Who doesn't think? No, no, sorry. <laughs> Friends, the historian wins every time because he's the eyewitness. He saw the bucket go under. He recorded the time. He saw when you came. He recorded the time. That's how you get the answer for any historical event. Science works in the present. So we can reach a few conclusions. The first one is that age cannot be measured. Scientific ages are always calculated and they're calculated based on assumptions. And do you know what? Depending on what assumptions you make, you can get any answer you like. If you don't like what you get, change the assumptions, get something else. The worst thing is, though, you cannot test your assumptions because you can't go back into the past. You don't have a time machine to see what was there. So, friends, age can really only be determined accurately by a reliable historical record. Now, I discovered something interesting the other day, that my mother was present at my birth. <laughs> Which um, possibly has been your situation as well. <laughs> Fortunately, my parents had the foresight to register my birth. So at home, I have a piece of paper which says Mark Harwood was born on this particular date. That is how I know how old I am. You see, there is no scientific experiment you can conduct on my body to determine my birth date. Because it's a matter of history, not a matter of science. So here's the summary, right? Science studies repeatable things, but history studies unrepeatable things. So, how do we get to the truth about our origins? Because we can't go back in time, can we? We need that eyewitness, the historian. And friends, that's exactly what we have in this book, the Bible. This is like God's history book of the universe, right from the beginning. In fact, it tells you what's going to happen right at the end as well. This is God's inspired word from Genesis to maps, uh, to, to Genesis to Revelation. Sorry. <laughs> now, God can tell us what's going to happen at the end because he has seen the end from the beginning, and only God can do that. And the very first thing that this book tells us is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Isn't it amazing that the very first sentence places us in conflict with the belief system of our culture? You can't even get beyond that. Well, let's have a look at some evidence in this world. So this is where I live. I hope you live on this planet with me. I had a school group recently and I did wonder. But anyway, it was out of the discipline... <laughs> wasn't this school. <laughs> it was out of the discipline of geology 
that this idea of the vast antiquity of the earth first arose. And the way it happened was this. People looked at things like the Grand Canyon and they saw all these layers and layers and layers of rock. And they had a belief system, a belief that said that the present processes we observe today are the only way we can explain all that we see in geology around us. There's a little catchphrase called, the present is the key to the past. I can remember being taught that as a student. It has a formal name, it's called uniformitarianism. Now we are going to do some science here tonight and there will be a short examination at the end, so please, no, 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 just kidding. But if you adopt that philosophy, you look at these layers and you think, well, each of those layers must have been laid down by some kind of a flood or cataclysmic event and slowly, over millions of years, all this material is, is laid down and built up and up and up. And then in the case of the Grand Canyon, along comes the Colorado River and it carves out this massive canyon. It must have taken vast periods of time. Wow. But then you have a close look at it. So here we have two layers, the Coconino sandstone on the top and underneath is a layer called the Hermit Shale. Now notice that there's a very sharply defined boundary between these two layers. Now that traditional uniformitarian approach to geology would have us believe that there are some 10 to 12 million years of elapsed time between those two layers forming. What that means is that the Hermit Shale lay there with its surface exposed for at least 10 million years. But friends, if that was true, would you not expect to find some evidence of elapsed time? Like, for instance, you'd expect to see signs of vegetation, tree roots, animal burrows, and, and certainly the next time it rained, you'd expect to see signs of erosion, creeks, rivers, valleys. But do you know, for the hundreds of kilometres that that contact is exposed on Grand Canyon, there is no evidence of erosion. You see, what it really says to us is that those layers were laid down one after the other very rapidly with very little, if any, elapsed time between them. So when you observe it, you get a different result. So have we ever seen some kind of a cataclysmic event which has left this kind of a signature? Multiple layers with sharply defined boundaries perfectly flat. Well, we have. Back in 1980 in Mount St. Helens in Washington State in the US, Mount St. Helens erupted and it caused significant change in the geology around the base of the mountain, including the formation of this structure called Little Grand Canyon. Now it's called that because it's about one fortieth the size of the real Grand Canyon. So it's something like 40 to 50 metres deep here. But notice in the walls of the canyon all these layers and layers of rock. Can you see those? And down the bottom we have this little river flowing. So if you apply the traditional view, all those layers that have been laid down one at a time, many, many years to deposit all that, and then the little river slowly carves out this massive canyon. But friends, none of that material was even there before 1980. How do we know? <laughs> it was observed to happen. Remember what science is about? Observation. Now, a couple of years after the main eruption, there was uh, a natural dam breached and there was a mud flow that came through that area and that mud flow carved out Little Grand Canyon, one fortieth the size, remember, of the real Grand Canyon, in just one day. <coughs> one day. That's all it took. But look, the signatures are all there that are usually interpreted as meaning vast periods of time. Now, the Little River is at the bottom of the canyon because, guess what, that's the lowest point and that's where the water collects. Right? But the canyon came first, then the river, not the other way around. So is there anything that might have happened in the past that could have led to such massive rock-forming processes on a global scale? Well, guess what? Three whole chapters, Genesis 6, 7 and 8, describe the global flood of Noah. And it tells us that all the springs of the great deep burst forth and the floodgates of the heavens were opened. And you know, scientists have puzzled over what might have happened back then and uh, they've looked at the evidence in the world around us. And it's clear that the bulk of the major geological features in the world today were formed catastrophically and by water. 
In fact, the Bible goes on and says that the waters rose and increased greatly on the earth and all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. Friends, that means it must have been a global catastrophe. Just think, the highest mountains all around the earth were covered. Now, people say, oh, but wait a minute, what about Mount Everest? Well, Mount Everest has marine fossils in its rocks. That tells us that once it was underwater. And so the mountains have in fact risen up after the flood. But is there any evidence of this? Well, here's um, a, a rock face at a beach in New South Wales. And you can see those multiple layers of rock. You find this sort of evidence everywhere, by the way. Down the bottom here is a sedimentary mudstone. There's a, vol a layer of volcanic ash, a coal-bearing layer. Then more volcanic ash, more coal, more volcanic ash, and so on. It speaks of a massive watery disaster punctuated by volcanic eruptions. This is a violent process and we find it on a global scale. We find the remains of things like this tree trunk running through multiple levels and layers of rock. If each of those layers took thousands of years to form or were thousands of years apart, the tree would have long since rotted and fallen over. But there it is preserved, polystrate fossils they're called. And look at this structure. Beautifully curved rocks, you can still see the boundaries between them. Has anyone ever tried to bend a rock? <laughs> what happens? It just shatters, doesn't it? How did those rocks get bent without shattering? You see, I think they were still water-laden, soft and plastic, and the Bible says that at the subsidence of the flood, the mountains rose, the valleys sank down, the waters rushed off the continents, there had been massive crustal forces, bending, folding, still plastic and pliable, and then they set hard. You know, I think it's a huge leap of faith to believe that gradual processes shaped the major geological features of the Earth, because the evidence doesn't support that view. But what a tiny little step of faith to believe that a global flood best describes the major geological features of our planet. But the Bible also gives us a clear timeline for the age of the earth. Did you know that? If you look at the genealogies, they're called chrono-genealogies. You'll find them in Genesis 5, 7, 9. You find them distributed throughout the Old Testament into the New. And it enables us to construct a reasonably accurate estimate of the age of the earth. You can't find exactly when it was made, but you get a good idea. For instance, we know that from Adam all the way through to Noah and to Abraham is about 2,000 years. We know from history and also from the scriptures that from Abraham all the way through David and the line of Mary and the line of Joseph to the time of Jesus is also about 2,000 years. So on that chart is something like 4,000 years of elapsed time. Now, of course, since the time of Jesus to the present day is about 2,000 years. So, if you're good at arithmetic, you'll have figured out now that according to the Bible, this is not my idea, right? It's what the Word of God says. Here we stand today about 6,000 years after creation. Wow. How could anybody believe that? I mean, we hear about the billions of years all the time. I mean, it's so authoritative. Just about every TV documentary will tell you about the millions of years. So... How can it be only 6,000? Well, friends, if that is true, and I believe it is, there would be evidence, would there not? Do you know there is stacks of it? I want to share just a couple with you quickly. Now, ladies, some of you here this evening may be wearing a diamond on your finger. It's called a girl's best friend, isn't it? Now, a diamond is actually the hardest naturally occurring form of carbon. But there's also a radioactive a form of carbon called carbon-14. And carbon-14 decays away reasonably rapidly, at least on the scale of radiometric dates it does. So, so much so that you really can't detect carbon-14 beyond about 60 to 80,000 years at best. Now, diamonds are believed to be between 1 and 3 billion years old. So if that's true, there could not possibly be any carbon-14 left inside a diamond. So naturally, nobody had ever bothered to measure to see if there was any there until some scientists sent a range of samples taken from different diamond mines to some laboratories who dated them, or rather detected 
um, f uh, looked for the presence rather, of carbon-14. And do you know that every single one of them had significant quantities, not just sort of background impurity levels, if that were possible, but significant quantities, indicating that the diamonds are actually only thousands of years old. Now, we had an article in our creation magazine. We called it Diamonds, a creationist's best friend. Now, carbon-14 turns up in embarrassing places for the evolutionist. Um, like, for instance, it's found routinely in coal. Coal is supposed to be tens to hundreds of millions of years old, couldn't possibly be carbon-14 present, and yet in every sample tested, once again, significant quantities found, indicating that the coal is only thousands of years old. Now, friends, that is consistent with the Bible's time scale. And uh, here's an interesting one at the White Cliffs of Dover. This is uh, a, uh, a deposit um, in the Cretaceous period, 65 million years ago, apparently, of uh, these tiny little diatomaceous creatures. And, uh, but the important thing is that these cliffs are eroding quite rapidly at the rate of about a metre every six years. But if they were formed 65 million years ago, at that rate, the cliffs, the shoreline, would have receded 10,000 kilometres. That doesn't make any sense, does it? So once again, if you observe a rate or a process happening today and then wind it backwards to see where it gets you, it does not stack up and support the evolutionary story. You know, it's interesting to look at the population of the world today. There are about 7 million, sorry, billion people on the face of the earth. Do you know if you start off with six people, Shem, Ham and Japheth, Noah's sons and their wives, about four and a half thousand years ago after the flood, and let that population rate grow at just under half a percent, you know what you end up with? About seven billion people. You see, it's consistent with the Earth's population. But we're told that humanity's been on the planet for 100,000 years. Some people think a million. But if that were true, where are all the people? You see, we should be shoulder to shoulder on every square metre of the planet's surface, including the ocean basins, and then some. But that's not the case, is it? There's an excellent article on our website that I recommend to you. There's 101 different ways you can place an upper limit on the age of the Earth, all of which are totally inconsistent with the evolutionary story. You can find it at creation.com forward slash age. You know, that tells me that it's actually a leap of faith to believe that the Earth is billions of years old because the evidence doesn't support it. That comes as a shock to a lot of people. But you know, it's a tiny little step of faith to believe that the Bible's record of history is true. Why? Because the evidence actually supports it. Now what about this question of the origin of first life? You see, people who believe in the naturalistic explanation for origins have to believe that at some stage in the past, an inanimate collection of chemicals had to spontaneously form themselves into the first self-replicating cell. And this is a process called chemical evolution. Now, Professor Paul Davies, who's an Australian scientist, he's not a Christian, but very astute scientist, said, nobody knows how a mixture of lifeless chemicals spontaneously organised themselves into that first living cell. Now, that doesn't mean he doesn't believe it happened. He just says, nobody knows. Now, it's bad enough to try and think of how all these complicated biological bits came together. But, you know, it's a bit like a, a computer. Um, can you imagine a computer forming itself by chance? You know, the power supply, the screen, the keyboard, the motherboard, the hard drive, all, all just happening by chance. I mean, it's ridiculous, isn't it? But let's imagine that it actually did. The machine is still useless. Because a computer is more than just hardware, isn't it? What else does a computer need? Yeah, power, but apart from the power supply, that's more hardware. It needs software, doesn't it? It needs an operating system. You know, every single cell in your body operates on the basis of the stored program in your DNA. So Davies goes on and says, how did stupid atoms write their own software? The problem's even worse than just hardware. If you could take a single cell and enlarge it to be the size of a city like Melbourne, you would see a bewildering array of complexity. You find communication networks, transport systems, power supplies, temperature control systems, factories producing component parts that are delivered to other factories for assembly into larger subsystems, and so on. 
All of this needed for the cell to operate. Inside the cell are these organelles called mitochondria. And inside the mitochondria are these um, membranes called cristae. And embedded on those is an amazing molecule called, or an enzyme, called the ATP synthase enzyme. Now, has anyone here studied biology and you know about ATP? Yep, a few people. ATP is like the energy currency of the cell. You know you can't blink an eye or move a muscle in your body without ATP. So the cell can't even function without it. Now some scientists were actually awarded a Nobel Prize for being able to image how this machine works. And it's absolutely remarkable. I want to play you a, an animated clip of what actually happens with this little enzyme. Now this is based on electron microscope imaging and other imaging technologies, very clever science, but it's an amazing little machine. Now remember when you're watching this, there are thousands of them in every cell in your body. This animated sequence shows the ATP synthase enzyme in operation. The animation is based on an incredible series of scientific discoveries. Only the colours show artistic licence. ATP, or adenosine triphosphate, is the energy currency of the cell. ATP is produced by a tiny molecular rotary motor, rotating it up to 7,000 RPM. These are so small that 100,000 would fit side by side in a millimetre. A current of protons drives the motor unlike man-made electric motors which use electrons. This portion of the enzyme is where adenosine diphosphate is combined with a phosphate ion in the presence of a catalyst to produce ATP which is then released making way for the next cycle. A top view of the enzyme shows the sequential operation. Almost every biochemical process in your body requires ATP. Such a nano machine exhibits all the characteristics of super intelligent design. ATP is vital for life and many of these motors were needed before the first living cell could exist. An evolutionary impossibility. How amazing is that? Can you imagine how the first cell formed up? You've got to have thousands of these that just form themselves accidentally for no reason. And then you've got to have some other biological bits and pieces that come together and, and they assemble the first cell and it starts working. I mean, it's bizarre, isn't it? Professor Sir Fred Hoyle, who's not a Christian but an astute scientist, said this, the probability of the formation of just one of the many proteins on which life depends is comparable to that of the solar system. Now, listen to this. The solar system packed full of blind people, randomly shuffling Rubik's cubes and all arriving at the solution at the same time. Can you imagine what that would look like? <laughs> I gave that away, didn't I? <laughs> you see, nobody in their right mind would believe that a self-replicating cell can come about by chance. It is a ridiculous proposition. You know, back in the middle 1800s, very famous scientist Louis Pasteur formulated what we now call the law of biogenesis, that life only comes from life. See, that's observable science. It's sheer faith to believe that inanimate objects can produce life. There is no supporting evidence for that ever occurring. And uh, I had to share this quote with you. This is a, a guy who, who received the Nobel Prize. His name is George Wald. And uh, he says this about spontaneous generation. One has only to contemplate the magnitude of this task to concede that the spontaneous generation of a living organism is impossible. Wow, he gets it. Isn't that amazing? But wait, he goes on. Yet, here we are, I believe, as a result of sponta a spontaneous generation. So even though he admits it's impossible, he says, I'll believe it anyway. Friends, that is blind faith. You know, in Romans it says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. I think it's a huge leap of faith to believe that life arose through time and chance alone. But what a tiny little step of faith to believe that life was created. Now, friends, we hear a great deal these days about dinosaurs, don't we? Any of the kids here like dinosaurs? Who's got a dinosaur book at home? Any of you young people? Got dinosaur books? Oh, I'll bet you have. 
Yep, and I'm sure you could name them all too. You know, they're amazing creatures, aren't they? And, and people look at the fossil record and they say, something must have happened to these dinosaurs to wipe them all out. Because when you go home tonight, I'll bet you're not going to run into a T-Rex. I hope you won't anyway. But what does the Bible say happened to the dinosaurs? And some people think, well, wait a minute, the Bible says nothing about dinosaurs. But actually it does. And let me explain. See, the Bible tells us that on the sixth day of creation, God made all the land-dwelling creatures. Dinosaurs dwelt on the land. They must have been made on day six. The Bible also says that God made man on day six. Now, from those two statements, we can reach a logical conclusion. Who wants to hazard a guess? What can we conclude from those two statements tonight? Man and the dinosaurs must have lived together, mustn't they? Now, no one believes that in our day and age. We're told the dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago, right? Man has never seen a dinosaur according to the established scientific view. But friends, the Bible tells us that man and dinosaurs must have lived together. And then we read in Genesis chapter 7 that pairs of all creatures came to Noah and went on board the ark. Logically, that must have included a pair of each of the kinds of dinosaurs. So they must have been on the ark. And then we read that every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out, only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. So you know what? All the dinosaurs not on the ark drowned in the flood. So friends, there really was a global catastrophic event that wiped them all out and we read about it in Genesis 6, 7 and 8. Do you know that paleontologists find dinosaur remains in this position, very frequently, it's called the epistatonic posture. Now, young people, that's a great word to memorise. Use it the next time you're at school and you'll impress your friends. But what it means is the animal's mouth is open, the arms and legs are outstretched, the tail is extended. It's the position an animal adopts under acute oxygen deprivation immediately prior to death. How do you deprive an animal of oxygen? Suffocation or drowning? And... It's Paleontologists are perplexed. Why are so many dinosaurs in this position? It's actually called the dinosaur death throes position. Friends, if they just read the history book of the universe, they would know, wouldn't they? But then it gets more interesting because the Bible tells us in Genesis 8 that all the animals and all the creatures came out of the ark one kind after another. Logical conclusion, two of every kind of dinosaur must have survived the flood. Now, that's interesting. I guess the ones that did would have been pretty happy, wouldn't they? But is there any evidence that the dinosaurs did not die 65 million years ago? Well, you know, there's a lot. Some fascinating things have just in the relatively recent time have been found. A lady called Mary Schweitzer was examining a T-Rex bone and she found to her amazement that it had red blood cells inside. And uh, she said to the lab technician, it was exactly like looking at a slice of modern bone, but of course I couldn't believe it. The bones, after all, are 65 million years old. Now, how does she know that? Remember, age is not measured. Ages are calculated. Calculations are based on assumptions. Assumptions are based on beliefs. She's been taught ever since primary school, high school, university, dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago. But there, right in front of her very eyes, observable science now, is evidence telling her that this animal did not die that long ago at all. A little bit later, they found the femur, that's the thigh bone, of a T-Rex. It was so big, they couldn't fit it in their helicopter, so they cut the bone in two and discovered that it had soft tissue inside, which, when stretched, was flexible and resilient and returned to its original shape. And Mary Schweitzer was amazed. She said... This is not something I ever dreamed I would see. You know, friends, there are so many stories in different civilizations around the world of encounters between huge beasts that are normally called dragons and people, like St. George and the dragon. And uh, here in Cambodia, this temple at Ta Prom has recently been reclaimed from the jungle. Around it are lots of stone carvings, including this one of an animal with bony plates on its back. Now when we look at that, what kind of animal do you think it is? Any young people? It's a stegosaurus, thank you. Now friends, 
Hundreds of years ago in Cambodia, there were no paleontologists around to tell those people that the animal they were carving was extinct. I'll let you think about that. You see, what they carved is what they saw. How interesting. I think that we can make a very strong case that the dinosaurs of history are actually one and the same as the dragons that we read about in legends. So, friends, it's actually a huge leap of faith to believe that the dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago. But it's a tiny step of faith because it's supported by evidence to believe that the dinosaurs were drowned in the flood, but two of each kind survived. So I began by saying that we have to be prepared. The Bible instructs us to be equipped to answer the questions that people ask of us. And that's what our ministry is aimed at doing. And that's why we exist. That's why we bring all these materials and resources. Now, I can't cover very much ground in a single talk. I mean, Pastor Phil did give me two hours tonight, but I'm not going to go that long. <laughs> but when you came in tonight, you would have received this magazine. I want to tell you a bit more about it. It comes out four times a year. It's written for lay people, so you don't have to be a scientist to understand it. And, you know, we get more testimonies from people whose lives have been impacted by Creation magazine than perhaps any other of our resources. In fact, this uh, lady wrote to us and said, thank you so much for this much-needed magazine. The information empowers Christians to share the gospel. And indeed it does, because we can share the gospel with confidence that there are answers to the challenges that the secular community makes to Christians. And uh, I like this one. This guy wrote and said, I was converted when someone gave me a creation magazine. Isn't that great? Someone just gave this person one and he came to the Lord. But look what he did next. Then I subscribed for five of my relatives. Four of them have now come to the Lord. How awesome is that? Now, according to my mathematics, that's an 80% success rate in his evangelism efforts. That's not bad. Who would like an 80% success rate? <laughs> Friends, perhaps I could ask you tonight, who already subscribes to Creation Magazine? Yep, a few people. That's great. Well, I want to tell you about how you can do that. Uh, as I mentioned, it comes out four times a year. You can subscribe for one or three years. With a subscription, you also get a digital subscription. So if you've got a laptop or computer at home or an iPhone, smartphone, or one of those iThingies that people download stuff on, then this is a great way for parents to give access to your children to a Creation Magazine subscription. This is faith-building material. It's fabulous stuff. And uh, for grandparents, in fact, it's great for giving access to your grandchildren. Now, for a one-year subscription tonight, we will give you a copy of this DVD called Fallout. It's a short DVD. It goes for about 25 minutes, and in it, a number of university students in a North American university are interviewed. Now, these students, all of them, used to go to church or went to church in their youth. Some of them now don't. And every single one of them that doesn't go to church now had not ever been exposed to the sort of material that you have heard tonight. They had no idea that there was a scientifically credible case that could be made for the truth of the historical record in the Bible. But every single one of them that was still going to church and going on in their faith had received instruction on these issues and they knew that their faith was grounded on rock solid evidence as well of course as their encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ it's a fantastic DVD good for giving to people who think it's not really an important issue now if you subscribe for three years then we'll give you not only the fallout DVD but you can have your choice of how Darwin got it wrong or this one creation evangelism now I want you to Pull out that little sheet here that's in your magazine. Now, does anybody here not get one of these that wants one? If you could just give us a wave and our friends group folks will make sure that you get one. Now, have a look at this little form because this is how you can uh, get access to these, these resources. But firstly, have, have you, has anyone learned anything new here tonight? Yep. Do you think this is valuable information for people to have? Yes? Absolutely. Some of you do? Absolutely. Good. That's what I like to hear. Do you think other people should hear about this? Yes. yes. Do you need to be equipped with answers to the challenges? Yes. 
I think the answer is yes. So this is the way to do it. Now, if you have a look here, take that pen. By the way, the pen has a little black dot on the end. I thought that was an eraser, but it's not. It doesn't work. It's a stylus for touch-sensitive screens, right? So we'll need to have an indication of whether you want a one- or a three-year subscription. Then, of course, we'll need to have your name, address, and contact details so we know where to send the subscription. And if you put your email address there, then uh, we can make sure you get your digital subscription as well. Now, if you want to get the email newsletter service, just tick this little box down here. Um, or if you've already filled this out, remember, that's another way of doing it. Now, a little further down the form, you'll see that red box. For those of you who already subscribe, perhaps there's someone that you could give, someone in your family or a friend that you're sharing your faith with who would benefit from this. Think about whether they could be the recipient of a gift subscription. And if you didn't get a chance to fill out this, if you just want to get the email uh, newsletter service, then this is the thing to do. Now, I'm going to... Uh, oh, sorry, there we go. That, that's the, uh, the did you know thing. Now, I'm going to stop talking and give you just a moment to fill those forms out. And then I'm going to ask our friends group people to come and, and collect these did you knows. So uh, uh, now's the opportunity to get equipped. And I'll come back in just a minute. Okay, something's not happening. We should have some music running. Okay. Okay, how are you going? I'm finished with those. Now I'm going to ask the friends group folks if they can just come down the aisles. Um, hand these in if you want to get that email newsletter service. Now's the opportunity. But take those magazine sign-up forms to our sales table, which is by the door, and our team there will make sure that you get your free gifts. Now while they're just collecting those did you know slips, let me tell you quickly about some of our resources out there. If you purchase just one book tonight, I'd recommend this one, the Creation Answers book. It uh, consists of 20 short chapters that address the most asked questions that Christians and non-Christians alike have. Things like, how do I know there's a God? Where did all the water go after the flood? How did Noah get all the animals on the ark? That's a good one. What about carbon-14 dating? We've talked a little bit about that, haven't we? And the classic question that comes time and again, where did Cain get his wife? Wow, the number of times that comes up. All there in the answers book. This one, busting myths. You know, there's a myth out there that no serious scientist would believe what the Bible says about creation. That's a complete myth. And in this book, 30 PhD scientists, leaders in their field, give their testimonies as to why they believe the Bible is absolutely true right from the very beginning. We had uh, a book and a companion DVD, Evolution's Achilles Heels, that was published a couple of years ago. It's having a profound impact worldwide. We had nine PhD authors wrote the book. I had the privilege of being one of the co-authors of that book. And here's the companion DVD where 15 different scientists are interviewed. And if you have a sceptical friend or someone who's steeped in the sciences and just clings to belief in science, then this is a great resource to bring them to the truth of the scriptures. And our core issues pack is out there, a collection of eight DVDs that address the most asked, or, or rather cover the most uh, relevant aspects of this whole origins debate. And that pack is available just at half price. And of course, don't forget that amazing website at creation.com. So friends, let me try and sum it all up like this. You see, the evolutionary story places millions and millions of years of death and struggle and suffering before mankind even appears on the scene. Do you know what that means? It means that death comes before man. That's what the evolutionary story tells us. But the Bible has it the other way around, doesn't it? The Bible says that it was man's actions in the garden 
that led to death and suffering coming into the world. You see, that is a radically different history, if you like, of what actually happened. And that's why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, for as in Adam all die, because Adam's rebellion brought death into the world, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. You see, the very reason that Jesus came to this earth was to pay the price of our rebellion. And what was the price? Death. Why? Because we, through our rebellion and sin, cut ourselves off from the source of all life. The only possible option was death. But Jesus took all of that onto himself, the perfect sinless redeemer, the son of God, so that we could go free. So friends, when we share the gospel with this lost and dying world, let's remember that we're not just talking about the wise sayings of an itinerant Jewish preacher who lived a couple of thousand years ago, but we're speaking, number one, about the creator of the universe. He is our perfect, sinless sacrifice. He went to the cross for us. But he rose from the dead, proving that he's the son of God and defeating death and giving a hope to every single believer. Friends, he's seated at the right hand of God the Father right now, interceding for each and every one of us. He's the soon coming king. And the Bible says he's the bridegroom seated at that wedding feast to which we have all been invited. So friends, if you're a believer here tonight and you've not known what to do about this whole issue of origins, I want to encourage you to get hold of the materials, sign up for the magazine, get equipped with answers to your questions and the questions of other people. Perhaps you're here tonight and you're not a believer. You might have come along at the invitation of a friend. I want to challenge you tonight to take that step of faith and put your confidence and trust in what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for you. You see, it's not a matter of doing enough good things so that you somehow or other earn 51% at the end of the day and pass. It's not like that. You see, there's nothing in and of ourselves that we can do to earn God's favour. It's only through an act of belief. You know, the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And what that, that means is that God miraculously places his own Holy Spirit into the heart of every single believer. And friends, that means that not only do we get to walk and talk with our creator every day, but we have a secured eternal destiny. So I would encourage you, if you're in that situation, I would encourage you to come and see Pastor Phil or Pastor Norma. I'm sure they'd be more than delighted to pray with you. So friends, it's been a great privilege to be able to share with you tonight, but I want to encourage you to go where the evidence leads because it all points to the truth of God's word. Bless you. Thank you.